Hi, it's Mark Bernard from the Bernard Institute for Cybersecurity. Today I'm talking about the technology stack. Uh, this is an important topic uh, to understand. A lot of us uh, have technology. We use technology on a daily basis, but do we understand what the technology stack is? No, not usually. So this is uh, something uh, to understand uh, for a number of different reasons, which we're going to get into. Now, if you've been following my videos, you know that I've been uh, publishing up to 100. That's my goal. And uh, there are many, many of my videos available on YouTube or on Vimeo. Uh, please uh, come and watch them, share them uh, with your colleagues or your friends, and be sure to like them so that we can get them circulating and share the knowledge of cybersecurity. Thank you. Uh, and without further ado, we're going to uh, dive into the technology stack. There are really three parts to the technology stack. There's the infrastructure, platform, and software. So let me explain a little bit. So the infrastructure is the underlying part. This is where we have uh, telecommunications. Uh, most of you are probably uh, familiar with Wi-Fi or hotspots. Uh, there's also hardwire lines where you might have uh, RJ45s or Cat5 or even fiber optics uh, running on your network. But definitely most of us are used to Wi-Fi's. Uh, we also uh, get uh, data access through our cellular networks. So this is part of uh, the telecommunication layer that sits on top of the infrastructure. And then uh, after that, we have firewalls, routers, and switches. This helps uh, divert the traffic and filter the traffic, looking for problems and hopefully preventing problems from happening, but also making sure that the packets get to the right destination when they're sent out. Peripheral devices are things like uh, printers or uh, shared drives. I guess even in, in some way the uh, the cloud might even be a peripheral device because we send our data up to the cloud. But peripheral devices are basically things that we attach to our uh, devices. If you have a mobile phone then a peripheral device could be wireless earbuds for example or it could be a speaker uh, if you uh, plug your mobile phone into some kind of a speaker so that you can speak over that um, when you're on a conference call. It can also uh, be other things like servers uh, that you plug into uh, with your devices or it could be external hard drives. Uh, there's a number of different things uh, that could be a peripheral device. Now in the Internet of Things uh, there are a lot of different devices that have technology stacks of their own that can connect to your phone but we won't talk about that today. Now all of these uh, devices have run software, so it's a combination of silicon chips, some kind of electronic uh, motherboard, or um, uh, to in order to transmit uh, uh, packets and process packets. Um, all of these require some level of patching, and you probably see this on a regular basis if you have an Android phone, for instance. Uh, you probably get updates on your Android phone. Uh, and then it asks you to reboot so that it can install it. So uh, when you're on the infrastructure, a lot of the patches uh, come in two flavors. Um, they come in microcode, which affects the very core of, of the device, close to the chip, to the processing chips. And then you have software patches, which get applied to the different applications to plug uh, maybe vulnerabilities or maybe to correct errors that are uh, happening, uh, some kind of... A, a, a defect within the product. So that is infrastructure. So infrastructure is basically the underlying layer that all of our technology sits on. <clears throat> and as you can see over here uh, on the uh, right, there's a number of vulnerabilities I listed. Uh, if you uh, checked into my video on common vulnerabilities or unknown vulnerabilities uh, or vulnerability management, I would have talked about this a little bit. Here's an example, uh, for instance, in the Common Vulnerability and Exposure Database, uh, there's uh, 1,619 known vulnerabilities with .NET. Now, .NET is the new uh, technology uh, that Microsoft is using to code Windows and Windows products in. Uh, the traditional Windows uh, has 7,972 different vulnerabilities in it. So that's quite a few. So this is probably one of the reasons why Microsoft decided to migrate to a new technology, a new coding language, and a new uh, architecture. Uh, Linux has 5,636. And generally anything that has a Unix uh, flavor to it, including Linux, uh, they are a little bit less secure than some of our more traditional products. And then you have uh, ZOS. And you can see that ZOS 
has only six vulnerabilities. And of course, ZOS is a, a product of IBM. Now, IBM has been around for many decades, um, uh, publishing software and building software and distributing software. So they're very good at what they do and they test things thoroughly. Uh, so this is probably why you have a very limited uh, number of vulnerabilities. Or maybe they're not reporting them all. That could also be a possibility. <laughs> Because it's not mandatory to report vulnerabilities. People only do it uh, because it's uh, it's good for uh, industry, good for consumers. Now, above the infrastructure layer, we have platforms. So this is the, the next layer. So the infrastructure provides the bed uh, that everything sits on. So uh, on the platform level, we have servers sitting there with operating systems. We have microcode and machine languages. Uh, being used, uh, uh, EBCDEC or ASCII or uh, again machine language, uh, zeros and ones basically, uh, it's hard to understand. These things require patching. These are micro level patching usually. And then you have utility programs that sit on top of the operating system that allow you to perform other types of function. So for instance, SQL, structured query language, allows you to go into the database and mine the data in order to cr create reports or produce uh, different pieces of information uh, that might be required. You have products like Zoom or WebEx or Teams uh, that provide uh, some kind of a communication uh, tool, uh, video and voice as well. And then you have .NET. Uh, we mentioned .NET down below. We have .NET up here at the uh, platform level. It's not just used on the operating system, but it's also used to, uh, to create uh, productivity tools. And then above that, we have security. Now, in some operating systems, security is actually integrated uh, within the system. But most uh, uh, operating systems do not have uh, security integrated. And this is a, a basically an opportunity for hackers to bypass security if they can get into the layers uh, and find uh, vulnerabilities which in, within the different layers that are below uh, the security uh, module or the security layer, then it's possible for them to maybe uh, hijack or exploit or get access to information, maybe even uh, encrypt uh, the database and run a ransomware attack. There's a lot of things you can do. And then on top of the platform is the data warehouse. The data warehouse is just like it sounds. It's a number of databases that contain uh, data. Uh, it could be one database, but uh, most uh, databases are normalized these days. So we have a database instance for each type of information uh, that gets uh, basically uh, connected together through a logical view that provides a record for the overall database. So it's very uh, distributed that way. Okay, so that's platform. And then above platform, oh, one minute. Uh, platform has a number of vulnerabilities. Here are some examples, for instance. SQL has 751 known vulnerabilities. MS Word has 243 known uh, vulnerabilities. Zoom has 57. Skype has 70. Python has 435. Python is uh, what we call a fourth generation language. Uh, so it's a pretty high level coding. It's not like uh, C Sharp or uh, Java. However, Java has a lot of vulnerabilities as well. You can see 2,100, wow. Uh, SAS has 44. Microsoft Office has 558 vulnerabilities. And Excel has 359 vulnerabilities. So there's a lot of vulnerabilities uh, within the stack. Uh, both within the infrastructure and the platform. Now the software uh, level is the top one. So this is uh, where uh, when you download an app uh, from uh, from the iStore or from uh, G Store and you install it on your system, it sits on top of the platform that sits on top of the infrastructure. And so this is how it's layered together as you can see. So I have ERP systems uh, listed here, but they could be apps as well. An ERP system is an enterprise resource planning system. Uh, there are some big ones like Oracle, uh, JD Edwards. Um, I think uh, there's uh, uh, quite a few BPICs. Uh, there's a number of different uh, types of enterprise resource planning systems. These are used mostly by commercial and governments, uh, organizations that have a lot of employees, a lot of products. They have general ledger systems built into it. They also have connections back to the warehouse. So there's a number of different components, but basically it allows you to organize your enterprise and, uh, and do planning and execution and manage uh, the data that's required because 
Almost every business requires the handling of some kind of sensitive information, but with an ERP system, we can automate some of that and put it into a system so it's, it works good. Um, a lot of ERP systems require patching on a regular basis. Okay, uh, No system has ever been made that's so perfect yet that it never needs to be patched. All systems need to be patched. And as you can see, patching happens at every layer. So there's the software layer or the app layer that needs to be patched. There's the platform area and there's the infrastructure uh, layer as well. And um, so you probably uh, get messages uh, to, down, to up, uh, update your apps. If you have apps on your smartphone, if you have software on your desktop or your laptop or tablet, you probably get messages to do, uh, you know, uh, restart. So shut down, restart and apply the patches or download the patches. You might even get asked uh, for your authorization to install it on the hard drive, which is another sort of a check and balance to make sure that you agree to it. And then of course there's customizations on top of those patches. So generally you get an app or an enterprise resource system that is kind of a vanilla code. It's a very general code that applies to many different industries or different situations or services. And then above that, you're allowed to usually customize it a bit and make it look and feel more like a personal device or maybe a personal piece of software, I mean, or maybe a piece of software that reflects your business model. Um, that often happens. Okay. And of course, software, uh, there are uh, vulnerabilities. I only listed one. SAP uh, has 751 because it was an inter it's the only enterprise resource planning system that actually reports on its vulnerabilities to the Common Vulnerability and Exposure Database. Again, uh, the CVE is not, uh, it's not regulated. It's not mandatory to report patching. Uh, a lot of organizations don't. And they have a lot of different reasons why they don't. So some believe that it makes them more vulnerable by reporting uh, that they have vulnerabilities uh, because hackers can go onto the CVE database and see what's there. But to be honest with you, uh, if you followed uh, my uh, vulnerability uh, management video, uh, you know uh, that hackers don't really uh, care about the CVEs. CVEs are interesting, uh, but not that interesting because they'd rather be more stealthy and uh, hack into a network without uh, letting people know that they're there. So they take a different route. Now, um, compounded security weakness. So what we have here is we have a number of vulnerabilities uh, within each of the different layers of, this, of the uh, technology stack. So this is the technology stack completely. You have infrastructure, platform, and software. Um, any one of these vulnerabilities could be exploited, as we see um, many, uh, many different types of breaches have been caused by different vulnerabilities within different layers. In some cases, uh, we're going to talk about the weaponization of software in another video, uh, but we're going to talk about something specifically about a worm. And a worm is a type of uh, uh, malicious software that has been weaponized. And the worm uh, basically will, once it gets installed on your uh, system, it will look for vulnerabilities throughout the stack and it will exploit each vulnerability. And sometimes it calls out to the CVE database and looks for the known vulnerabilities. Once it understands what kind of technology has been uh, deployed within the organization. Now we have a classic uh, example of that, the Stutnex uh, worm, which almost created a nuclear uh, meltdown of a reactor um, in Israel. So this was a very serious uh, worm that got into uh, the infrastructure by the use of a thumb drive. So you probably know those little USB drives that you stick in to copy information, save it. Maybe you're going to take it to a printer and get it printed, or maybe you just want to save the files onto a secondary piece of uh, a media. Well, that USB can also contain code. So it's possible for somebody to load code onto a USB. And when you plug it into a device that it automatically gets copied over and, and may be executed. Some operating systems automatically execute code. Other operating systems don't. Uh, the majority of them do. Uh, so uh, anything that's Unix will execute automatically without reading it. However, there are some systems that are uh, what we call object-oriented operating systems that won't do that. So for instance, um, IBM created a system a few years ago, a mid-range server, which I happen to be a guru on. Um, it's now called the System I, um, but it was originally called the AS400, so you might have heard that name, maybe not. 
But this system is based on object technology. And what it does is the operating system will read the label on the object before it actually executes the code inside the object. Very, very smart. Um, but Unix systems do not do that. If they see a .exe file, they will just automatically execute it. So um, it's a little bit crazy, but that's that's the way some systems work. And you can imagine the vulnerabilities. Again, none of these vulnerabilities uh, have to be reported. There's no regulations around it. But I think that there should be. Uh, there should be definitely some uh, regulations around uh, patching and regular patching uh, to make sure that these systems are secure. Uh, it should probably be some regulations around uh, the fact that uh, manufacturers of software and hardware do security testing and uh, and that they certify their uh, systems to be somewhat secure. Uh, it's not a big stretch. I've worked in uh, 11 of 16 critical infrastructures and uh, many of them are heavily regulated. I would say you know, the pharmaceutical industry comes to mind. I've worked in several pharmaceuticals and they have a number of uh, different uh, requirements as well as the health authorities uh, that they have to comply with. And the FDA is actually the regulator uh, for all medical devices. So they require anything. If you produce a, a biomed device that uh, monitors uh, life or provides breath or any of those uh, you know, very vital functions to humans, um, it has to be reported uh, to the FDA and to anybody who purchases their equipment if there are any security vulnerabilities and the manufacturer automatically has to patch these. Uh, so this is something that happens on a regular basis. So there are specifications for that and it is regulated within uh, the health industry, but no other industry. So it's kind of crazy. Anyway, um, so there you go. There's the technology stack. If you have questions, feel free to email me, call me, text me. Uh, you know I'm on social media. Also, you can sign up to my uh, website and you can get regular updates uh, if you like. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, uh, or uh, Twitter. And uh, again, uh, there's many other uh, videos uh, that I'm producing that provide some kind of knowledge about different products of the cybersecurity program and uh, different aspects, functions, and technology uh, with the cybersecurity program. So I'm sharing this knowledge with you. I want you to share it with others. And please, if you find this useful, don't forget to like uh, the software and share it. Thank you very much and take care.